Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Just Two Dads with my co-host, Sean Francis. I am Brian Altunian, and today we've got a special guest. We should actually have called uh, today's show uh, Just Three Dads. Three Dads, um, yeah. We're going to be talking with uh, with David Hirsch and his 21st Century Dads organization. It's going to be a fascinating call. Love having conversations with uh, with dads, supporting other dads in a special needs community. Uh, so stay tuned for another episode here of Just Two Dads. Awesome. Welcome, everyone, to, uh, to our Facebook Live. Uh, if you don't catch us here live on catch us out on, on our uh, YouTube channel, uh, we are Just Two Dads on YouTube. Also, if you're catching us on uh, podcast outlets, welcome. Hope that uh, this is going to be, a comp- we know that this is going to be a compelling conversation. It's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting dialogue. And for those of you in uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands on WSTX AM radio, welcome. Uh, looking forward to seeing you. I know we keep talking about it, but we're going to come down and see you all pretty soon. And uh, finally, everybody on our uh, Roku channel under Empower Media Communications, uh, welcome. Uh, we'd love to have you interface with us, interact with us, engage with us. If you're catching us live, please put comments in the uh, in the comment section there. Joe Quinones, David, Joe Quinones is my daughter, so uh, <laughs> she's part of this conversation on a regular basis. Uh, we'll get a chance to interact with her a little bit as well. It's my, my primary joy. Um, so we, as we get into it here, uh, just want to say uh, it's a Great to have you have you here. Sean is going to do a little quick intro and then tell everybody who you are. So I'm going to throw it to Sean, and then Sean, we can open this conversation up. Sean, by the way, I'm going to ask you the same question I ask you every show. How, how are you feeling today, buddy? I am feeling great and blessed. Uh, I, I feel that way generally speaking. I always say that people must get tired of hearing me say that and wonder if it's really true. But <laughs> You know, one, I know it's it true. It's why that, I ask you. It's why I ask you yeah. every time because I know that it's it true. makes sense to it. it makes sense to go through life looking for your blessings. But I always have a certain amount of gratitude for the, the the gift of being able to wake up and see another day. And then when we get to spend a portion of the day having conversations like this, that gratitude increases. Generally speaking, but especially so because today we are, um, you know, we are always joined by uh, fairly kindred spirits on the show, but from the standpoint of a fatherhood that applies more today than it has with probably any other show. And welcome to the show, Mr. David Hirsch. David, welcome. Glad to be with you guys. Looking to have some fun today. As are we. Uh, you you may think that, you know, when you're so busy doing what you do and being who you are, um, you know, it may not seem like uh, a great thing um, or something that is, you know, all that quote unquote, big a deal. So you may not, may or may not see yourself as a hero, but we like to think that the people that we sit with are in fact heroes and all heroes have powers and all powers have an origin. So with that said, let's start by you telling us a little bit about yourself, your childhood, and you know, what got you uh, introduced to um, the special needs community to begin with. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, guys. I love what you guys do and promoting the uh, involvement of fathers in their children's lives. Um, so my backstory briefly is that I was born and raised in the Chicago area. Um, my mom raised me and my younger brother from my age six as a Chicago public school teacher, which is another way of saying there was, wasn't a lot of resources. And thank God for my maternal grandfather, Sam Solomon, who uh, helped step into the shoes that my dad exited out of. And um, it's a little bit rocky at the beginning. But uh, I would say that um, one of the reasons that I feel so passionate about father involvement is that I really struggled with the relationship that I had or didn't have with my own dad, my biological dad. And um, I was pretty angry. Um, I'm not proud to say that, but uh, I had a lot of issues as a young guy. And I tried to channel that energy in a positive direction. So flash forward, um, it's circa 1996, my wife and I who have now been married for almost 39 years, um, had our fifth child. Thank you. And um, uh, I was very sincere about looking for fatherhood resources. And I uh, stumbled across some statistics that I just couldn't believe were true. And the estimate is that there's some 24 million kids across America that are growing up in father absent homes. You do the math and it's like four out of every 10 in America. And um, there's a perception, what I refer to as a misperception that is those poor inner city black kids and by the way, you know, let's just be 
black and white about things. Um, it's really bad in the black community in America. Seven or eight out of 10 kids are growing up in father absent homes, but in absolute mm -hmm. numbers, and we're all financial guys, right? That's what we do for a living. So I'm going to get a little mm -hmm. nerdy on you with the numbers. <laughs> um, there's two times the number of white versus black kids growing up in father absent homes across America. So it's not somebody else's problem. It's our problem. It's a societal problem. And it gets sanitized by, oh, it's the breakdown of the family, right? Let's be clear about it. These are kids that are not being raised in households with their dads. Men have abdicated their responsibilities. And I'm not saying that they're bad people. It's just saying that, hey, if you're not living with your kids, you have to make a super special effort to be involved with their lives. And, uh, you know, um, it's not by choice that most women find themselves as single moms. My mom didn't choose to be a single mom. Um, I think that these uh, women who are raising the kids are heroes. They're real heroes in the mm -hmm. in or in society. Sure. But sure. we could do better as a society. So long story short, um, I couldn't believe these statistics. So I helped start something called the Illinois Fatherhood Initiative. It's one of the country's first statewide not-for-profit fatherhood organizations. The simple mission of that organization, it has been for most of its existence, is to actively engage fathers in the educational lives of their children. So one program that we started, starting back in 1997, it sounds very trite. We copied it from somebody else. It was an essay <laughs> writing program, and it was being done by the National Center for Fathering, then located in uh, Kansas City. And they had this relationship with the um, Royals and the Twins. They did this essay contest in two separate cities, and they were getting like 500 essays from the school kids of those two locations. And then they partnered with the baseball teams, the Twins and the Royals, to uh, do something on Father's Day, right? To recognize some of these dads that the kids wrote about. And I was sort of one of those snooty Chicagoans and thought, oh, we've got two baseball teams. Somebody's always going to be home on Father's Day. We can do this. And uh, we uh, connected with the uh, different school systems, the State Board of Ed, Chicago Public Schools, the Office of Catholic Education. And we were blown away by the response. We had 30,000 kids respond to that first essay contest. We literally wow. did not know what, but we had made a commitment to read all those essays. I scrambled, I helped recruit 400 individuals, men and women, young and old, people with means like the three of us. And in some cases, literally, no exaggeration, incarcerated dads helping evaluate what the kids of Illinois had to say about their dads, stepdads, granddads, and father figures. Wow. So uh, once we were done with the essay reading <clears throat> and we'd started to select the um, essay finalists, and we realized that it was such a profound experience. Those 400 volunteers, you know, had this insight into what the children of Illinois had to say about their dads. Uh, we thought it would be too bad if that message didn't get out further. I had what I thought then was an epiphany, um, a brainstorm. It turned out to be a brain squall because it, the idea <laughs> did not go very far. But um, my idea was to take a $5,000 grant from a local organization we we're going to print 5,000 essay booklets before the mm -hmm. essays, two per grade, K through 12, or first through 12th grade, it was the first year. And then um, we we're going to sell those essay booklets for $10 each. You don't have to be a math major. You can take $5,000 and make it into $50,000. And we uh, got the local food store to give us like end caps and put a little promotion out there. And there is no market for essay booklets. They're, they're not a book, they don't have an ISBN number, and they're not a greeting card, they're much larger than a greeting card, so they don't fit with the Hallmark cards. So we ended up giving away most of those essay booklets. We did, I don't even think we broke even on that idea. But one of those essay booklets found its way to Harpo Studios, and I got a call from one of the producers, and they said, oh, we love what you're doing, we're working on this special Father's Day program. It's going to air the Friday before Father's Day. This is still June 1997. And they said, we'd selected these seven essayists out of the 24. We'd like to have them come in for a taping. And we'd like you, David Hirsch, to be on the Oprah Winfrey show. And I'm like, are you serious? She goes, we're not serious. <laughs> so I got to bring one guest with me, right? It was my mm -hmm. maternal grandfather, Sam Solomon. He at the time, I'm going to guess he was... 89 years old. He died a wow. four years later. So this was a surreal experience to be sitting there being interviewed by Oprah. There's some video out there. If you guys want to try to find it. Um, I was shaking like a leaf 
he might not even recognize me because I had hair back then and I don't have hair anymore. <laughs> but it was, it was such a fun experience. I, I just want to recap what I've just said. We decided to do this essay contest, which we did in February. We collected the essays in March. We had the essay reading in April. We did the essay booklet in May. And we were on the Oprah Winfrey show in June. It was like a whirlwind experience. Um, and that was the very start of the Illinois Fatherhood Initiative. Flash forward, you know, two dozen years, um, we've collected well over 425,000 essays from school age kids throughout Illinois. Wow. And, you know, that organization still plays a role, right, in helping fathers be more actively involved in the educational lives of their kids. So dads who are listening, if you could only do one thing, if you forget everything we talk about and you have amnesia, remember one thing. Um, all you need to do is lean in from an educational perspective, right? All the research shows mm -hmm. that when parents are involved, that means how do we get the dads involved in education? Um, all the educational outcomes go up and a lot of the things that are holding kids and our families back, which include drug and, incar drug, um, and alcohol abuse, um, crime and incarceration, teen suicide and pregnancy, all those things go down or go away. So that's the Illinois Father Initiative. Those are my street creds, if you want to call it that. And about <laughs> five or six years ago, um, I had this notion about getting a bunch of fatherhood organizations to work together. I was going to ride my bicycle from Santa Monica to Chicago. And uh, it seemed like a pretty strange idea because I didn't own a bicycle. You could do that on. And I am not an endurance bike rider. I'm not even an athlete. I would just say that I'm <laughs> athletic, right? I like to work out. I've done some marathons. I've done some triathlons. And when I was telling right. people I was going to ride um, from Santa Monica to Chicago, um, they were like, well, we hope you don't kill yourself or get hurt, but, you know, God bless you. So <laughs> um, one thing led to the next. I bought a bike, put a schedule together, trained, flew out to LA, started pedaling back. And uh, 21 days later, from June 1st to June 21st, which was Father's Day, this is circa 2015, um, I rode all 2,325 miles. I lived to tell the story. And uh, that was what we called the Dad's Honor Ride. And we honored dads from community to community, raised a respectful amount of awareness, maybe $100,000, $150,000. We distributed that amongst a bunch of uh, fatherhood charities, including the Illinois Father Initiative. And uh, that was the beginning of the 21st Century Dads Foundation. We did a couple more Dad's Honor Rides, Boston to Chicago, around Lake Michigan. We realized that's probably not the most efficient way to raise money. And uh, I was spending three weeks a uh, summer, right, on a bicycle, which is like, what am I doing here, right? <laughs> much better time of, you know, better use of my time. So anyway, um, we've done a number of things which I think are entrepreneurial. Um, within the 21st Century Dads Foundation to raise money and awareness. And that organization is the organization that birthed what we know today as the Special Fathers Network, this dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Um, we started interviewing dads early on, uh, helping them tell their stories, you know, these authentic stories, you know, just ordinary guys uh, telling their mm -hmm. story about raising a child with special needs. And uh, it's been a blast. Um, I, I just love connecting with guys like yourself. And I'll just say one more thing that um, with all the advocacy I've done in the world of fathering, that I think that the parents, this includes moms and dads now, that I've encountered uh, for the last uh, couple dozen years um, are on average more humble, less arrogant, and less selfish. And at the end of the day, who do you want to be spending more time with? I would argue that there's enough arrogance, there's enough selfishness, and there's a lack of humility out in society. So uh, I'm happy to be with you guys. Thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about the 21st Century Dads Foundation and the Special Fathers Network. Sure, sure. And Brian, Brian is gonna just jump into something, but just so yeah. you know, yeah. uh, you look good with and without here. So we found that <laughs> video, we put it up in the chat. So, you know, so anybody that's looking at this live can actually see it. Uh, both a cause and a good looking dude with a good message. Yeah. Go ahead, Brian. So David, you, you, you kind of covered a whole bunch of things. And so I just wanted to, you know, just go back for a second because, because the, the special needs connection wasn't part of the initial conversation, right? So there's, right. there's a transition here at some point or not a transition, but an inclusion. So just for a second, because, because you, 
I mean, you're doing amazing, amazing things for as 21st century dads. You know, I know that the focus originally was on father, you know, fatherless homes and, and, and making that connection. And, and I know you've written a book and thank you, by the way, because we got a copy of your book, um, your first book, 21st Century Dads, A Father's Journey to Break the Cycle of Father Absence. So uh, I'll put that in front of the camera there for a little bit. We'll put it on the chat as well because it's not a very good picture. Um, but uh, but that was about, you know, again, creating that that uh, that alignment. And I do have a comment to say about that as well. But 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 just want to talk about this transition because because now, you know, the the work of the, of the Special Fathers Network is is and, and you know, is really honoring you know, fathers of special needs children. So how did that transition occur? Because it wasn't part of the initial. initial yeah, well, you're like, basically asking me because you want to test me because as a father raising a child with special needs, you want to make sure that I'm part of the part of the team. No, right? no, I know you're part, I know you're part we of the team. We already know you're I, part I, of the team. About that. We want everybody how, else to know. How that transition <laughs> happened, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let me be as transparent as somebody can possibly be. Um, my wife and I have five adult children. They range in age from 25 to 32, and we do not have a child with special needs. We've had some pretty serious challenges along the way. One of our daughters was part of a set of twins. Uh, the twin, the other twin was not viable at maybe 14 weeks. Um, as a result, she was Sorry. born seven to eight weeks premature, NICU, couple weeks, lung issues still to this day. Um, uh, that Quincy, that same daughter had anorexia. Right, which is like a nightmare that like a hand grenade that got thrown in our family when she was 16. Um, so we've had our challenges, but I, I try to be very clear that I am not a father in the traditional sense of um, somebody who's raising a child with special needs. Um, my brother does have special needs. He's 60. He's my younger brother. And my mom taught special ed on Chicago public schools for the last 13 of the 38 year career that she had as a Chicago public school teacher. So I think I have some familiarity with uh, special needs. And what I found about a decade ago, I was saying some of the best parenting that I've witnessed is in the special needs community. And these moms and these dads are some of the most outspoken advocates for their sons and daughters. In some cases, I guess out of necessity because their kids are so darn vulnerable. And I've always had this high admiration. So um, we'll go back. Here's the turning point. I'm just going to be crystal clear about how we got from being the 21st Century Dads Foundation to creating the Special Fathers Network. It's not a big secret, uh, which is uh, we did these dads honor rides, Santa Monica, Chicago, 2015. I was the only person other than some friends that I recruited um, to participate in that ride. All the guys that I know that have these fatherhood organizations from East Coast to West, community-based, hospital-based, company-based, um, fatherhood organizations, no one put a person on a bike that first year. And I thought, okay, I did pull the idea on them pretty quickly. I started talking about it in March or April, bought a bike, started training, and we did the event in June. So they said, oh, you need to give us more time. Okay, we are going to ride from Boston to Chicago next year at this time. You have 11 months advance notice, same situation. I was the only person that rode from start to finish. Um, we had 38 riders that year. So people did ride for days. I think we had 10 people ride for a week, week one, week two, or week three. And, you know, it dawned on me, you know, I've got a lot of time to think about things when you're out on a bike for six, eight, 10, 12 hours a day. Sure. But, <laughs> there's it's a like pattern here. Alive, right? There's a pattern here. And uh, I'm doing a lot of the work and raising some money myself and a lot of awareness and we're distributing the money because i agreed to be uh, the person who's going to be the you know guy taking the high road and uh after the second year you know it started to dawn on me that this is not working right we're we're not engaging these other fathered organizations and uh we'd already made a commitment to do the third dad's honor ride that was 2017 around lake michigan and um we started to reflect on, you know, this is just not working, right? This small not-for-profit board and I reflected on where are we going with all this? And um, about the same time that the third ride was over, um, we had to make a decision. Are we just going to close everything down and say, you know, it just wasn't meant to be to get these various father organizations to work together or do we pivot? And you'll just have to take my word for it that, you know, I know uh, a little bit about fathering and trying to address this issue of father absence in society. And we narrowed it down to four categories. Very simply, um, 
raising kids in high poverty areas like urban areas and rural areas across America. The second was men who are incarcerated, you know, not just removed from their family, but re removed from society at large. Uh -huh. And then the third category was teen fathers, men who in most cases become fathers inadvertently about, you know, high school age, um, not intentionally. And then the fourth was, like I said, um, I had this utmost admiration for fathers raising children with special needs. And it might, from my perspective, it's like, oh my God, these guys are going way and above, above the call of duty, right? They're hanging in there. They're doing everything they can, trying to just you know, maintain some level of um, balance between work and family and all the other challenges that they have. So we lopped off the first two categories. We focused on teen fathering and uh, dads raising kids with special needs. And we came to the conclusion very quickly, there's very little infrastructure around teen parenting. There's some programs for teen moms, but not too much for teen dads. And right. while I want to support young fathers, um, teen fathers for that matter, um, we felt this warm embrace locally here in the Chicago area from Special Olympics Illinois, from Gigi's Playhouse, which was started here in the northwest suburbs of Chicago by, coincidentally, friends and neighbors, fellow parishioners, uh, Paul and Nancy Gianni, who are Gigi's parents. And uh, at the time, they only had, I think, 40 playhouses. And they said, you know, we don't see enough dads coming through our playhouses. It's mostly moms. We would love to support what it is that you're doing. So that's what the beginning of the Special Fathers Network was, was to focus on creating a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program for fathers raising kids with special needs. And the podcast, you know, gave us some visibility that we wouldn't have otherwise. I've interviewed dads from virtually every one of the 50 states across America and at least a dozen different countries around the world now. And, you know, it's amazing, right? There's 500 plus dads like the two of you who've agreed to be mentor fathers and lean in, you know, help a younger guy who's close to the beginning of his journey, raising a child, hopefully with the same or similar special need, same demographic, same socioeconomic group, same ethnic background. Um, and, you know, in a perfect world, the match is done with a local dad right? So you don't have to just be a virtual like Zoom, sure. Skype, you know, email, that type of thing. You can actually get together face to face for a soda, a cup of coffee and, you know, develop a relationship. And by the way, we plagiarized that idea too, right? This was an idea that a friend of mine whose name is Johnny Emmerman. And Johnny, I'm just going to give you another shout out here. Um, Johnny uh, uh, started something called Emmerman's Angels. It's a cancer support organization. It's been around for about, I don't know, 14, 15 years now. And Johnny is a two-time testicular cancer survivor. Oh, um, the wow. second time he was going through his recovery after surgery, chemo, radiation, the whole nine yards, um, he decides to volunteer in a pediatric cancer ward. So it was such a profound experience for him. He decides to recruit some of his fellow cancer patients to volunteer alongside him. And flash forward to today, they have more than 8,500 cancer survivors in their database. They call them the Emmerman Angels. And they match them one on one with cancer fighters, people that are, you know, in the first five years of their cancer fight. And they've matched them, I'm not exaggerating, well over 50,000 times. And I'm on one of these long bike rides. I'm thinking, you know, if we were to put a peer to peer mentoring program together, uh, what would it look like? And I just couldn't stop thinking about Immerman Angels. And I thought, okay, we're going to substitute the angels, the Immerman Angels, the cancer survivors with seasoned dads like yourselves, right? Who have some experience, usually 10 or more years of experience raising a child or children with special needs. And we're gonna match them with the, the new guys, the guys that just got the diagnosis, not the guys getting the diagnosis, but sure. the father of yeah. the people, yeah. young people who got right. the diagnosis right. either at birth or you know, shortly after. And uh, um, it's been a very profound experience. Uh, we're not nearly uh, where they are today with 8,500 volunteers to serve as mentors, but we're close to the beginning of our journey. And I'm hoping, God willing, that we'll recruit hundreds of more, if not thousands of more dads to be part of the Special Fathers Network, and we'll match them, you know, as many times as we can identify these new dads, which is a topic maybe for conversation here, maybe not. But what's really hard is to get in front of these young families. I'd call them the zero to three families, the early intervention families, because, you know, think back to when you first learned about your child's situation, either at the time of birth mm -hmm. or you know when it was diagnosed, uh, typically a year, a couple, three years later, you're in denial, right? Oh, you know, yeah. you're overwhelmed, definitely, right? Definitely, you know, you're not right of the right frame of mind 
that you're like, oh, I'm going to go out and find a mentor, right? Because there's got to be somebody that knows more about this than me. You know, you're you're during the headlights. So anyway, we can use everybody's help to get the message out about how to get in these young families. But definitely, the first thing I want to do is encourage you to give yourself credit because the way that we, again, this is why being able to have these conversations and have this show is such a blessing because we've redefined for ourselves um, individually and as a team what you know how how we see or define the term special needs, and that continues to evolve. So your daughter, your daughter situation. Um, with regard to anorexia and everything that that there's a medical component there but as far as we're concerned that qualifies as, as you know as, as special needs it's not just about is so and so neurotypical or not neurotypical the bottom line is about being able to overcome a challenge and um needing any kind of accommodation with the needs that we all have as human beings and so that definitely fits so you're not um any bit removed from it at all and then having a brother you know you're 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 in the community from uh, by circumstance as much as you are by choice but that but your desire to even um uh, not have that validated but say it with trepidation whatever the case however you want to look at it is just another you know example of your authenticity so that that's great and then everything that you're talking about here it's completely um inspirational to say the very very least yeah well and you've had it and you you've you've been doing your podcast now your dad to dad podcast for how long david about four years there we come out weekly on fridays um and we've been pretty religious about being every week uh for the last two or three years yeah, yeah. and i've already where can that be found 30 i've already recorded the next 30 episodes i think i'm good through like September 16th or something like that. <laughs> Amazing. And where can they find that? Anywhere I'm that you find podcasts? Very lucky. I'm sorry. That's funny. Where where okay. where can where can our audience find your uh, find the podcast? On all the legitimate podcast uh, platforms. Um, gotcha. So Spreaker, Apple, 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 Google, Spotify, all those. Yeah. Wherever you find them, yeah. Perfect. Good. Yeah. Good. 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 Hopefully, at some point, if they ever categorize, they're going to put ours, ours just together. You've got just your dads and dad to dad. So it actually makes sense. And, you know, we're thrilled that we have, you know, had the opportunity to actually be guests on your release. We've taped it. And uh, and our introduction was because of, of Susanna, Susanna Peace Lavelle, who introduced us. And she's a friend of our show and been part of our um, a part of our podcast family since we almost since we started. So, um great uh again great supporter of us and, and and a fan of yours and so we're grateful she's a uh, coach for families with uh special needs uh family members and so um and also part of the we are brave together support group as well so susanna hello shout out to susanna there um no, let's give yeah. her a big shout out thank you yeah. so much for the introduction thank you for the work that you do i love your energy and uh, uh all we need to do is run you through a cloning machine susanna and the world will oh, be seriously great. <laughs> if that's possible, go. right? <laughs> if that's even possible, if that's even possible, absolutely. Um, Sean Hall, uh, who's our our producer, who's out in uh, in Hawaii, had posted up on the um, uh, on the chat 187. Sean, those are 187 that have aired to date. David has actually recorded over 200 now. It's, again, he's 38 or so episodes ahead, as opposed to Sean and I, that we're just two dads having a conversation. We do everything live, and we're like, you know. We're, Hopefully we hear that we've got next week handled and the week after that handled. We're a, we're, we're a much tighter, probably a much tighter ship. Actually, a much looser ship. Clearly, um, yeah. We're like, do we okay. add value or cause chaos no, no. or both? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a bit both. But here's the great thing about it is that for, for people who have listened to us or have seen an episode before, um, you know, this is how life is, right? Life has to be uh, spontaneous, especially when you have a child with special needs. You can have all the you know best intention in the world to have a schedule and have something set aside and and planned and then you know something occurs and so there's one thing i remember when i was a, when i was a new parent that was something that was like you you're just gonna throw planning out the window and just yeah just chaotic chaotic value as, as, as sean says we had chaotic value but just be prepared to be to be unprepared that's okay and then add the other component of adding a special needs child who has, as you said, extra consideration, things that require our focus, our time, and our effort. So this show is is exactly, our our podcast was modeled after how Sean and I kind of deal with our own lives, which is on the fly, 
ready to go. And, um, and uh, we love having these conversations because honestly, we love talking to folks like, like you, David, we, uh, all of the guests, obviously we, we love all of our, all of our guests, but there's a difference between a guest who, who has that experience, you know, with a special needs child, and then they've taken that experience and they, you know, turn it outwards and serve the community. And that's a special kind of person. But there's another special level, which is somebody who, like you, does not have a special needs child, even though you have your, you have your sibling and you observed it and your mom is a special needs educator, but that you've taken this on as a, you know, as a, you know, as a, as a mission, as a crusade to shine the light on those people who serve this community um, because you're, you're really coming from, from outside that parental perspective of dealing with a special needs child and you're, and you're creating an opportunity for those of us to, to bond in a network and provide some support for one another. And, you know, we're blessed and grateful uh, for the work that you do. And this is not a mutual admiration society, folks. So I'll get excited, but, but it is because we, we want everybody to know, like there are special people out there in the world. The message I think that you said, when we first get, get uh, diagnosed and we're hit like a deer in the headlights, we don't know where to turn. And it's just, we don't know what next steps to take. And so to be able to have a conversation with somebody who has been through those next steps and can be a guide and can just be a voice of reason and calm and, you know, and support is, is so valuable. And so the fact that you've been doing this for four years, um, really is a testament to your commitment to this and to this network of, of dads and to the work that you do. And so, you know, we're honored to be part of your network and be, and have you be, you know, in, as part of our network and just, you know, blessed, to be able to have this conversation. And the last thing I'll say, and I'll be quiet after this, but the last thing I'll say is the <laughs> fact that you professionally are in the financial, are in the financial industry as we are as well. Um, it's, it's refreshing. Um, it's, it's for us, it's, it's to know that there are folks who are over focused on money and financial matters and creating dreams for, for people to accomplish their goals. Um, yet that's, that's a, that's a key thing. We didn't feel that there were many people in our industry who, who focus and support uh, the special needs community. And so, again, grateful to know that there are eyes and hearts focused on this particular community that we're, that we're a big part of. So, again, I just want to say thank you. If I don't get a chance to say thank you, thank you for being a part of what, what this is all about. And this is what makes our commitment just that much more rewarding. Yeah, well, I love the way you guys roll, right? It's really loose. It's sort of like <laughs> in a moment. And uh, there's a lesson to be learned there because remember, I'm like uh, a numbers guy and was a big eight public accountant. I was an auditor and a tax accountant. And it's like, everything has to be balanced, super control oriented. And uh, you know that's good at some level, but it's not healthy at another level. So I think that uh, the flexibility that you guys have, uh, which maybe is an outgrowth of, you know, like you said, you know, as a parent to a child with special needs, uh, you learn flexibility right? Because the plans you make, you know, need to be super flexible. And you also mm -hmm. learn patience, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Things take longer, a lot longer, right? Yeah. Than you could ever imagine, right? So if you're impatient, right, that's going to steal a lot of joy from your life, right? It's going to make life a lot more chaotic. So I think that those are two of the attributes that you develop that, uh, you know, just become part and parcel to who you are. So I love the way you guys roll. Oh, Thank well, you. We appreciate that most <laughs> definitely. You. Definitely. That, it's, it's fun. You know, when we first started this and we were like, you know, we're just having conversations. We were like, you know, well, who's going to listen to us? You know, we're just too tired to have a conversation. And they were like, and they were like, are we going to have enough time to like fill an hour? That's a long time. And then you're like, an hour is a long time. We, we underestimated our, our ability to gab. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny but uh um, you know it's yeah. it, it, it's interesting and, and my appreciation for what you do is um based on my experience as well uh you know because as some people know you know my wife and i um of our seven children four are uh, my sister-in-law's children whom we uh adopted and it's funny how you you learn different things at a level the day that my son was born I stood there, you know, I helped cut the court. And I remember thinking if I was absent, regardless of the reason, whether I had a job, even if it was successful, that took me away, or if I was a deadbeat dad in a way or whatever have you, anybody else that's present would be his dad, regardless of anything biological. And then 
in raising our children, you know, you just, you, you do what you do and you don't stop and, and realize how important the role of a father is it's important for it to be identified and then um, lived up to. And part of that is because I've been spoiled too, because regardless of any challenge at any point in time in my life, you know, I've always had my dad to turn to and still do to this day. Um, and I will never be able to thank him enough. Um, you know, for also having that type of relationship where we can talk about any and everything because not everybody has that. And you hear about so many successful stories where people become great successes despite not having a dad or a father figure around. So it can often be, um, be taken for granted. And so it, I wanted to kind of go back a little bit too. When you talked about, you said you, 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 I don't know if you said you were ashamed to say, but not happy to admit the anger that you had, you know, that's that alone one it's, it's okay. And it, to feel that way. And it would be strange if you didn't, but it again underscores the importance of the father and, and not just the role because you had your grandfather that stepped in, but yet there's still part of you that is like, why is he not here? And there's anger. I had um, a family member um, um, that I was having a conversation with earlier uh, about their mom who had went through sort of, you know, the same thing. And it made me stop and think about how that affected who she became, you know, so you, it's, it, it's just, it, it, it's huge. I can't, you know, um, I can't underscore it enough. Yeah. Well, let me uh, share a short story with you um, that I think will emphasize the point you're making, Sean, which is um, I finished that uh, bicycle ride, the one from Santa, Santa Monica to Chicago. I had the mm -hmm. opportunity to uh, give a TEDx talk shortly thereafter. And um, I thought candidly that was harder getting up in front of a live audience wow. of a couple mm -hmm. hundred people and speaking extemporaneously for 18 minutes with slides that I was not controlling. I did not have the clicker in my hand. Somebody else was clicking for me. Wow. I thought that was like a nerve wracking experience. In fact, I felt like this huge sense of relief when I walked off the stage. I'm like, oh, wow, that was a lot harder than riding my bicycle from Santa Monica to Chicago was. <laughs> Obviously, it was only 18 minutes, but the <laughs> tension that I had was just like, oh, it was unbearable. Anyway, um, shortly thereafter, um, I've decided that um, I, um, I, I want to uh, share with people uh, not only the story about doing the bicycle ride, but I had this idea for a book. And um, I got together with a friend who's a very well-known author. And she said, uh, let's meet for lunch. And uh, right before we were supposed to meet, she goes, oh, I have a friend. I'm going to invite my friend John along to lunch. Do you mind? I'm like, whatever. So we're, uh, we're eating lunch. We're eating our salad. And uh, you know, we've each made some brief self-introductions. And this guy who I've never met before, I have no idea really who he is or why he's even at this lunch, says to me, you know, that dysfunctional relationship you've had with your dad is a real gift. I'm like, what the fuck? Um, how could he possibly say something like that? It was like the most insulting thing you could say, you know, to somebody you don't know. And I'm thinking, how could you possibly know the slippery slope that I've been on for, you know, my entire life, which is then, you know, to age like 54, 54, 55. And uh, he could tell, like, I was really getting animated right? Like I was going to lunge across the table at him over a salad. And <laughs> yeah. I said, John, with all due respect, you have no idea what you just said. That was like the furthest thing from a gift. Um, and he said, wait, 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 back off. He said, what I meant was you would not be the person you are today. The husband that you are, the father of your children, the advocate, the outspoken advocate, like you have been for father involvement, if it wasn't for that relationship with your dad. So I was thinking gift, box, ribbons, bow, you know, somebody, mm -hmm. somebody to please them, right? That's what I was thinking when he said, oh, that's been a real gift. And right. what he meant was, and again, you wouldn't be the person you are today. So it took my Neanderthal brain like two or three seconds to process that. <laughs> and it sunk in. Yeah, I guess that's right. I wouldn't have called it a gift, but it's true. I wouldn't be the person I am today had I not gone through that very, very challenging experience over not just a short period of time, but 
over decades and decades. And um, it, it dawned on me that um, I should talk to this guy further, right? We were connecting. So we were literally talking about a different book idea that I had about um, female role models, right? I wanted to interview uh, women who are from all different walks of life to be role models for young girls. I have three girls as well as two boys. And when I was a younger mm -hmm. dad, I was really disappointed at the role models that my girls sort of held in high esteem, which was um, women who were models, women who were actresses, and I guess right. athletes. That's who young girls see as their role models and their moms for that matter. Um, right. thought, you know, there's so many different career paths that young girls can pursue. I'm gonna interview the superstars in every one of these different career paths and we're going to put this in the form of a book. And that's why I had uh, asked this woman to go to lunch. Um, so uh, I pivot. I developed this relationship. His name is John St. Augustine. The two of us write the book, um, A Father's Journey to Break the Cycle of Father's Absence. And um, I told that story, the very story I just told you, the lunch story at the very beginning of the book to give him you know, a credit for you know, getting through to my Neanderthal brain. And uh, we formed this relationship. And when we had this idea for the podcast, I reached out to him because he's got like decades of production experience. He worked at Harpo Studios on the Oprah Winfrey Show. He worked for Dr. Oz, producing the Oz Show. Works for Bill Curtis currently. He's written a number of books himself. Really, really talented guy. And he's got a good voice for radio. So um, I said, John, I've got the idea to do this podcast. I'm going to bird dog the interviews. You're going to do the interviews. It'll be magical. And he said, I'm flattered that you want to do another project together, but I don't have the bandwidth. He said, I'll tell you everything you need to know about podcasting in less than 60 seconds. Oh, I got my attention. So <laughs> here it is. You need to have a good idea. The world's not short on good ideas. It needs to be yep. well executed, good recording equipment, good content, well edited and produced. Um, check. Um, then the third thing is you need to, build an audience, right? How are you gonna get people to listen to your show? And that turns out to be where the rubber meets the road, I think, for most podcasts, which is, these are good ideas. They're being well executed, like today. But, you know, how do you get people to listen? So you need to inspire your audience to share and like the program so that more people find out about what we're doing. So to the dads that are listening, the parents that are listening, um, they don't even have to be parents. You're just listening because, you know, you find this, on the platform, the message that uh, Sean and Brian have to be inspirational, right? Hit the like button, right? right? Share the story, right? right? That's the best way you can compliment them for what they're doing. Well, you could write them a check. I'm sure that they would. Be that too. But I'm, I'm thinking, you know, do what we all want, right? Which is to validate what we're doing, right? By sharing and liking the messages. So anyway, I'll get off my little soapbox. No, no, I we, uh, definitely, definitely appreciate that. I want to, I wanted to go back to the book idea just here for a quick second because I had, as you were talking about your essays, um, I, I, I was immediately uh, drawn to an idea that I had, um, uh, that has already been executed. It's not my idea. Um, one that I found fascinating. Are you familiar with, uh, with Post Secret? You know the Post Secret. Does that sound mm -hmm. familiar at all? Nope. So there was an artist, his, uh, his last name is, is Warren, W-A-R-R-E-N, who had an idea um, that people would share, are reluctant to share their deepest, darkest secrets with somebody one-on-one. -on -one. But if they, could send some, if they could send that in anonymously, um, they would be able to, to, to do that. And he, he thought he would be able to post anonymous postcards. And he just said, just post simple postcard, gave them an address to send it to. Um, and like you, was so completely overwhelmed by the response. Um, he he did his initial uh, uh, art installation was a massive wall because not only did people share their deepest, darkest secrets that they never would tell anybody, that something, it was a sense of release. There's a sense of, you know, of you, you know vulnerability obviously but 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 it get, being able to get that off your chest uh that people took very artistic forms in how they communicated they weren't just sending black a blank you know postcard they were very artistic they were they were very you know uh, amazing how creative folks were in in this 
And so he did a first art installation and the cards kept coming in and kept coming in. And finally he put together a coffee table book. I have a copy of it here somewhere. <laughs> it, it's fascinating. And he would, you know, broke them down into different like mental health and, you know, um, you know, crimes of passion and, you know, all of these things and, you know, things you got away with cheating and things that you, you know, but she was able to categorize these. And, uh, and as a, as, as a viewer, you know, or a reader, I was, uh, I was so moved by, first of all, what people shared, but the idea, the concept that they, that that that, that was an had been an internal, you know, challenge for so many people. It was, a, it was, a, it was something to to, to release. Um, how cathartic that must have been for them. Uh, hopefully, I'm on my hope. I'm optimistic. I hope that has. As you were talking about the essays, I I as a as a father, um, I would be so moved you know, to read essays of the impact that, you know, that, a, that these children writing about their father or their uncle or their grandfather or a father figure that made a difference in their lives. Um, I would not give up that idea. And I know you did that and I know you put it out there and, and everything, but I still would not give up that idea. I think that there's a time for, um, for that. It, it, it's, it's not only is it self-reflection, but it's just, you know, it's, 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 it's it, we've talked about this uh, when we were together last it's about empathy and love and it's an expression of empathy and love. If you can, if you can see that I'm, I'm 45,000 or 30,000, however, thousands of essays that you got. Um, the fact that Oprah Winfrey's producers found so much value in all of that. I still think that that's a, I still think that that's an, an, an amazing idea just because I, 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 I think we can relate to it. And I think for new fathers, to not realize or not understand the impact that they can have on their children and those in, in, in their care, um, to be able to see it, it gives them something to step into, but also gives them something, you know, some sense of, of, of reflection. And so anyways, I was just, when you brought, when you said that idea, the first thing I thought was post was post secret and, and the, and the incredible impact, by the way, he has a website now and he's still, I don't know how many volumes of, of the coffee table book he's put out, but, it is a substantial amount of communication from folks from all over the world. And, and I just, I think what you did, the intent behind it is so amazing. And I think it's so impactful and I still would love hearing it today. I would love to see something like that um, be put out in, in book form or ebook form or some form, because I, I just, I think there's so many lessons to be learned from that. Yeah. Well, let me uh, make you a very simple uh, offer, which is uh, we have uh, created a PDF of the essay booklet, which also includes a curriculum, right? For dads to read and reflect and resolve to do something in their own lives, right? To improve the relationship with their own children. So I'm happy to make that available to you, no cost. Um, and you can make it available to all of your viewers and listeners, right? And if anybody- We'd love that. Do an essay contest, a local essay contest with their school, their school district, their state, you know, I am ready, willing, and able to offer my technical assistance to do this, don't do that. Don't beat your head against the wall, right? We'll show you the ABCs of how to effectively execute one of these essay contests. And what I will say is that one of the reasons that these essays were so powerful is that these kids are writing from their hearts, right? 100%. Yeah. Um, and they're very authentic, right? In the essay book that you'll see, for those that take us up on the offer, these essays are in the same handwritten or printed version if they did it like on a word processor that the kids submitted their essays right these aren't like messages that we've you know, modified from a marketing <laughs> or promotional standpoint so there's a very high level of authenticity and the last thing i'll say about these essays is that one of the things we learned from the very get-go is the direct way to reach the heart of a father is through the words of his children right uh -huh. it's the reason we save all those things that we put on our um refrigerators Right, have them all over. Right, we all I'm have looking them. at it now. Yep. Right. You know, we used to like paper a hallway yeah. with the artwork, like down yeah. the stairwell in one of our um, in our house, um, with all the stuff that our kids created. Right. It's just this is who they are. They're just being so authentic. So yeah. anyway, anything we can do to get kids communicating with their dads, right, letting them know how they feel. Well, let's mm -hmm. be honest. Right? When the little kids are writing about their dad, he's bigger than life. He's Superman, right? I mean, he's yeah. physically bigger than life because they're like three feet tall and he's six feet tall, right? Yeah. Bigger than life. And as the kids get older, 
right? They start to get to the same height as their parents. Now they're literally mm -hmm. looking at their parents from a different angle physically. And then because now they've got a little experience, right? Um, you know, they're seeing their parents from a different perspective. They're seeing them, you know, more as an equal, right? Not only in size, but, you know, in life, right? And everybody knows that, you know, when you're raising teenagers, the parents are the stupidest people on the planet, right? You know, the, the eye rolling, like, what could you possibly know what it's like to be a teenager, right? Well, yeah. duh, I was a teenager like 30 years ago, right? And, uh, yeah. Not until they get to be like 20 something and they maybe they go to college, maybe they don't. And they're like, God, how'd you get to be so smart, mom and dad? Right. When I went to college, it's like, we've always been smart. You just like came up to speed with everybody else. Right? <laughs> so, anyway, yeah. um, I can relate to what you're saying. It's funny. The, I think it was I think it was Mark Twain who said, you know, when I was seven years old, my father knew everything. And when I was 14, my father knew nothing. And when I turned 21, I was surprised to see how much the old man learned in the last seven years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So David, at this point a, in the yeah. at this point right. in the show, um, we have um, <laughs> a, a question that we will generally ask, and it is as follows. Uh, sometimes it, it it may throw some people off, and some people are like, "Hmm," it it brings them great reflection. But our ability to change the world is, which we all here strive to do, is based at least in part on our um ability or willingness to change ourselves and our views so if you can give us one example of a thought view or belief that you held dear and really believed strong for most of your life but no longer feel the same way about hmm you should have given me this before so i could have yes. reflected on it. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> thank you for popping the question the good um, thing is that there's no wrong answer i know i know um, something that I, I'm just question to clarify, something that I used to believe for a long period of time and then maybe came to realize that I don't believe that anymore or I maybe came to the realization that maybe I didn't have a good view on things. Mm -hmm. huh. Can I get back to you? <laughs> <laughs> We usually no, ask I, the question ahead of time to give you time to reflect on you know, that. I, but, uh, I, I'll, I'll try to answer. I think that um, I used to be more black and white about how to do things. And what the first thought that comes to mind isn't so much from a parenting perspective, but from a work perspective. Um, I used to make 100 to 200 cold calls a day. Um, to build the business that I have over the last 36 years. And it looks like, oh, it's easy peasy. And, you know, I'm really enjoying, you know, how, how easy things have come to me. But the first four or five years, I really busted it to try to make things happen from ground zero. Um, and maybe you guys can relate to that, you know, when, it, when you're at the beginning of your career. You know, I didn't sure. get, I, I wasn't given a book of clients. I had to cold call and, you know, the numbers game that, you know, you all put up with is for every hundred calls you make, you like get through to a third of the people, um, two thirds of those people hang up on you, maybe say something bad about you, the company or your mom or something. And then of the 10 people that like listen for 60 seconds, one of them might become a client or a customer over the next uh, 12 or 18 months. So that means you had to put up with 99% rejection to find that one person. You don't even know who that one person is going to be. And uh, you just keep bludging yourself, calling, 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 calling. So um, I had proven myself. My business started to take off. i uh, been a multi-million dollar producer for like better part of 30 years. And um, we would hire people. And I would say, this is the way you're going to do things. And I would butt heads with people um, often. Um, and it was my way or the highway. Right. And, you know, I'm the one who built the business. I'm going to tell you how you should do things. And if you don't agree with that, maybe there's another place for you, but not here. And I think that it, it probably took me at least a decade of butting heads with other individuals, mostly client service associates, 
to realize that, you know, there's more than one way to do things. And, uh, you know, it takes a team effort. And as a leader, right, somebody who got steeped in leadership along the way, um, you need to provide people with direction on what the objectives are and then get out of the way, right? And uh, it, it wasn't something that came to me naturally. I don't think leaders are born. I think leaders are developed. And I'm so thankful for the formal leadership training that I got, uh, mostly from 93 to 96 as a Kellogg Fellow, WK Kellogg Foundation Fellow. I was one of 50 individuals selected from around the country to go through a three-year interdisciplinary leadership program. Oh. And it was that experience that taught me a lot about people from different walks of life, um, people from different uh, socioeconomic groups, and uh, people you know, who don't share the same views as you share, right? You know, yeah. I grew up in corporate America. I believe that capitalism is a good thing. Well, geez, like 80% of the people in this fellowship, like 40 out of the 50 thought capitalism was the root of all evil. I'm like, well, I'm in a minority all of a sudden, right? How do we, you know, communicate, right? Agree to disagree. So it was an enlightening experience for me, transformative experience for me to go through this leadership training. And um, yeah, I had some really good mentors along the way too. So um, I wouldn't say it was one thing, but um, a number of things that uh, allowed me to realize that, you know, it's like raising kids. Like you might have a disagreement with your wife about, you know, what's important or how to do things. And, uh, you know, you need to have the grace to say, hey, um, I've got my own ways or views of doing things, um, but maybe somebody else, my spouse or the mother of my children, you know, has as good, if not a better way to do things. And maybe there's uh, some compromise or a happy medium there as well. And um, I think the sooner that we as men and as dads can realize that, you know, there's uh, a different way up the mountain or there's a different way to skin the cat, if you will, um, we're all going to be better off for it. We'll have healthier relationships and hopefully uh, be uh, more productive and success, however you define success. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you for that. And as we're going to wrap up our episode, um, I just want to thank everybody for contributing. Thank you for posting in the in the chat. I don't know, uh, uh, Dave, if you're able to see some of the comments throughout throughout the the conversation. We have some links in there for some folks. If you're listening and you want to see, you want to get the links, go to our YouTube channel. We are just two dads afterwards, and the links will be in the chat there. To things like uh, David's book and his organization and podcast and. Uh, and uh, even there's a post secret, a link to post secret. So um, please, please feel free to um, to like and share. And and again, we thank you for your contribution. And as I always say, we wrap up the show. Can you make one more comment? Yes, sir. Um, did you guys get your great dad coins? We did. We did. Yes, we did. Thank yes, so, thank you very much. This is what they look like, right? Yeah. Front and back. These are the things that we've been using to honor dads the last seven or eight years. And I've had the opportunity share in most cases in a solemn handshake, you know, presenting these coins to the dads, thanking them for being the dads that they are, thanking for them to be the role models that they are. And I only wish that I could have presented you, the two of you with your coin in a solemn handshake. So we'll do that when we finally get together face to face, wherever that is there in California or in Illinois or someplace, like we'll bump into each other in an airport or something. But uh, <laughs> the reason I, um, I want to bring this up is that I did not have a chance to talk with you about this, but do you know what happens when we run into each other and you don't have your coin with you? Mm. What's, that? What's that? You have no idea? Okay, this no. is not something I'm making up. This is something that comes from the military because these are like challenge style coins, right? So the way it works is that if you don't have your coin when we bump into each other, um, you have to buy me a drink. <laughs> I have guys that I know have their coin they're like, oh, I don't have it. Let's go for a drink. So <laughs> using that as a reason to get together. Fellowship. Uh, in all it. seriousness, uh, I really respect what it is that you guys do with your Just Two Dads podcast. The uh, message that you have is a wholesome one. I admire you for the fathers that you are and uh, the contribution that you make to the community and humanity. Thank you. So no, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Thank God. I'll, Sean, I'll just say, you know, again, at the end here, the empathy and love, folks, remember, empathy and love. You ne don't know exactly what's going on in somebody's life, so be empath empathetic uh, and look at, through the, look at the world through the lenses of love, and the world will look like a different and much better place. So, Sean, I'll have you close us out, and, uh, and again, thank you again, David, for being a part of our podcast today. My pleasure. Again, thank you to David. Thank you to all our viewers, uh, everyone that takes the time to uh, see and or hear us wherever you might be. I want to make sure that I thank the women in my life without whom I could not be who I am. And that is uh, my uh, mom, Jan, and my amazing wife, Laura. Um, and I just want to everyone to, again, remember somebody someplace um, needs to know that, um, that, th that they matter, needs to know that you see them, um, that, they're, that they're heard. It's a whole other topic, but on the topic of you know, um, mental illness, there's so many people that have, in addition to people that have taken their lives, there's people who have um, been on the verge of doing so and have chosen to do otherwise because somebody stopped and said, are you okay? Or asked, um, um, you know, or gave a hello. So just remember that we have more of an impact on each other than you know. And wherever you are watching or listening, we love you and we'll see you next time. See you next time. Thank you.